right, so we're going up into the Vulcan. Aircraft was built in 1960 at a place called Woodford in Cheshire. It was one of about 120 that were built in total. History about it. Yeah. But say the crew could be seven. So you've got captain, co-pilot, you've got radar navigator, navigator plotter, air electronics officer, air refueling officer here and crew chief here. Wow. Your seventh man. Seven people. Yeah. Yeah. But you've got to think in that particular time rationing was still on. Yeah. Um, so we were a bit smaller, were they? <laughs> rationing stopped about 1956. Yeah. But up until then, of course, you couldn't get the fruit, you couldn't get the vegetables, you couldn't get the meat like you can today. No. So that most of the guys I've seen and talked to over the years were a bit smaller. And they're like that small. Yeah. So I can rest my chin yeah. on their heads, you know. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to the pilot and co-pilot, this unit here normally lives under the floor. See this unit here? Yeah that lives on the floor while the pilot and co-pilot get in their seats and then this is locked forward and locked into position and that is a fuel management system of the aircraft because you've got seven tanks in each wing with 9,250 like <laughs> 9, gallons of fuel in yeah. and what you would do with this unit, the co-pilot, he would manage the fuel and use it to, as weight to trim the aircraft Right. and you'd be able to transfer there's loads and loads of switches, racks of switches on here that look like a, a circuit diagram and so you can actually transfer fuel to various parts yeah. of the yeah. wings to actually trim it up. Yeah, they're doing all that manually and I suppose nowadays it's yeah. all done automatically isn't it? Totally automatic, yeah. yeah. Um, part of the way down here on this panel is uh, one in the bomb bay. There's a tank in the bomb bay with the 1,250 gallons in it and the gauge for it is there. Again, that's managed by the core pilot and uh, 1,250 gallons is what this aircraft burns an hour. So it's an hour as a fuel, yeah. 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 So you've got to think that an eight hour trip, say you're going to go to Aquatiri in Cyprus, it would get you there and back. Yeah. Would, if you got some bodies aircraft, then of yeah. course you would need to refuel. Yeah. And today it equates to £33,000. It would cost to refill this aircraft and refuel. Um, when it comes to actually oh, getting... What happens to the ejector seats here then, are they? Well, there's no ejector seats no. on this side. You're in assisted seats, you two. Yeah. So what happens here, you're flying along, and uh, something happens to the aircraft, and the pilot and co-pilot hopefully try to keep the aircraft straight and they'll give you time to get out. But the only problem comes is trying to get out of your seat, because you'll be probably pushing 2 or 3G at the time. Yeah. And so you, I've got a new way to get out of your seat, so I'll just swivel the seat down. You pull that knob up there, yep. and there's a compressed air cylinder in the back of the seat. It yep. expands the seat and kicks you out of it. <laughs> it does. So it's like undoes your buckles at the same time. And the straps for your harness, your parachute, are over here. So as soon as you get on the aircraft, you clip this out. Clip that on. That's yeah. what that space is for. You think, what's this about here? Yeah. But it's the same on them seats as well. Yeah. So you're down here. And of course it's pressurised to 9 pounds a square inch of pressure in here. Yeah. So you've got to release that pressure. So there's your lever, you pull down to release the pressure. You want them to get rid of this hatch. And the ladder that they came up is actually taken on by the last man and stored up here out of the way. Yeah. Because you can use that like a slide to actually get out of the aircraft. So to open it up, you press that to one side, that blows the hatch and drops it and then you jump out. <coughs> Hopefully the undercarriage isn't down at the time, which it was on one occasion. I was talking to one of the crewmen yeah. and he had to throw himself out really bodily head first yeah. to get away, get away from the undercarriage. He was three or four hundred miles an hour at the time oh. and he would be slapped up against the yeah. first part of the undercarriage. You know? Not good. No good at all. No. So on most occasions the back crew never got out. No. 17 Vulcans have crashed, 17 back crews have never got out. Oh. No. no, no. But the Martin Baker did actually make a set of three seats, ejector seats for the back, but the government would not pay to no. have it converted on any of the Vulcans, he said. Yeah. No. So they'd rather lose Lives the crew. Cheaper, yeah. bit, it's cheaper yeah. Yeah. to lose the crew. Yeah. When it comes to these two guys, we've got the ejector seats, so Martin Baker marked three ejector seats. Uh -huh. And uh, the other says the only two in here. What would happen first is there's a lever either side with a pin in it, both sides there. But what you would do, pull the pin out like a grenade, pull the handle back, blow 
that off, the, the whole thing disappears. There's four explosive bolts that kicks it well above the tail. And then what happens then, you would then pull those yellow and black handles there. And uh, if that top one doesn't work, the secondary one is between your legs. So you pull on that one and that whole thing will work. Yeah, we got it. Yeah. And what would happen then, you, you would leave this aircraft at 80 feet a second, pulling about six times the force of gravity. And in the process, of course, you pass out because of the pain that's involved. And I'll tell you why in a moment. And I say it'll compress your spine. It, it does compress your spine, yeah. yeah. So you're Ooh. well above the aircraft now and you've passed out. And what happens, the pressure switch takes over, that pressure switch on there and disconnects you from the seat. And then you then fall on your parachute. Of course, you've hit cold air. And you know, as you come down, you'll Not come around, yeah. hopefully. But you're not going to land on your legs, never. Because your spine has been compressed by an inch and a half. Oh. So just think about putting you in the vice and doing that with you yeah. and squashing oh. you together. You know? So when you actually land, you roll over and you get taken to a hospital for five days and stretched out again <laughs> on traction. And I've had traction done and oh. it's not very nice. And you put this machine, it does that. It does it until you stretch you out again. And then I've seen and actually talked to guys who've flown Harriers and they've sort of ejected twice and said never again. Because you know, in some cases they end up in a wheelchair, yeah. or you know, you just never know what. Yeah. If you're fit enough, it depends how fit you are. Yeah. You know, it depends if you can cope with it. But test pilots who do it a yeah. lot of times yeah. when they were testing ejector seats, yeah. you know, they first and testing first aircraft as well. Yeah. You know, it's just been quite incredible. And when it comes to wanting a P, that's what you'll be given one of these, and this is. The last one of seven, all the rest have been stolen from me. <laughs> and that had to last you 10, 12 or more hours. Yeah. That did, so you know. It's just a bag really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah just, yeah. and it doesn't expand very much. It's quite a thick rubber, you know. Yeah. So yeah, after that's full, nowhere to put it. So you'd be cross legs the rest yeah. of the flight. You couldn't go to the toilet properly in this aircraft. There was nowhere for you to do that. Mm. So yeah, I have to be really Hang careful. As well. You have to hold on to that too. Yeah. yeah. And what would normally happen, the pilot and co-pilot, they would be given their P-tubes, but they have a connection uh, at the bottom of the flight suit which they can use, which they have like today, a lot different today. And when it comes to bomb, the bomb run, these two guys here could release the bombs, but before that, this was the first, actually first one, and he would lay down his tummy and do the bomb run, just like you see in the war films, yeah. you know. Yeah. And he would be going along and talking to the pilot and co-pilot, sort of saying left a bit, right a bit, and then he would release the bombs. And then, of course, he would pull away. Yeah. Normally, it only took about two and a half minutes on average yeah. to release the bombs. But that went out of use. And the two guys up here, the ones who released the bombs. So you've got the button there, the red button there, and you've got one on the co-pilot side as well. So they were able to release the bombs. And I know they were cut, so I know they weren't used. Because the guy who finally did it is where you're sat, right. the radar navigator, and he had the power of life or death. Because the captain, just like you see in the nuclear submarines, a key puts a key into a slot on the left hand side, which is yeah. gone now. Turn it one way, either to arm, either the bucket of sunshine mm. or the £21,000 bombs, which there's two in the museum, £21,000 bombs yeah. there is. Yeah. And uh, the bucket of sunshine, of course, is a nuclear weapon. Mm which is carried two or one very large one. Co uh, there's one called uh, the Blue Sun, and there's various other names of uh, that particular type. And the largest one it carried was WZ-177B, and that was wouldn't even go in the bomb bay. It was that large, you had to strap it underneath the aircraft. And it's really a fallacy that when the aircraft were painted white, the only reason they were painted white is not because the, the flash you actually soak up the flash is the fact she's blending with the sky because mm. you would be 50 or more miles away before it even went off mm. you would you know because that clear bomb could power itself to the target say 50 mm. miles mm. away mm. and you'll be turning around yeah. and gone in no time as fast as you because this aircraft had a turning circle of a mile and so it'd be well and truly out of the way before yeah. anything really happened yeah. But people keep saying that it's anti-flash white, no, well it wasn't again, it was the fact you couldn't see it in the air. You know, the fact mm. she's 99 foot long with a 100 11 foot wingspan she has. Top speed of 645 miles an hour. Mm. And uh, 
when it comes to cruising she normally does it about 50,000 feet she would do yeah. and the bomb runs done about 30,000 feet and again see the chap here would take over and do the bomb run he would take full control of the aircraft we're using like a joystick there once he'd actually locked the target on and that screen and he would fly it just like you would use a normal joystick on an aircraft yeah. and for the two and a half minutes it took to actually do the bomb run he would then take full control he could reprogram the autopilot which is the two guys up here have and for that two and a half minutes once he'd done that and the bomb doors were closed and they're away from the target he would then give control back to the pilot and co-pilot but to know that the bombs had gone you've got a periscope there and you look down that periscope to check all the bombs had gone mm. and this is the only Vulcan that ever brought the sound by you the only Vulcan mm. in the world and uh, they took her up to 50,000 feet and lost control of it they did at maximum <laughs> speed wow. and she went from that to that 30,000 feet and brought the sound barrier and of course she was up oh. all the way down or whatever stuck God. came unstuck and at 20,000 feet they pulled out and they landed her and when they landed they found that the nose was pushed back and the radar in the nose that weighs four tons and also the wings were ribbed like a garage roof <laughs> yeah. and when they got down of course the pilot got out and was talking all the rest of the crew ground crew and one of the top brass came to it and said you've done it you fly it home and they had to fly it home. I actually had the chap in here the pilot who'd done that and he said believe me it was really really difficult to do that you know, particularly with r wings that were ribbed you know it would break up that as you're flying and the nose was squashed in flat as well so it must have been one hell of a job to keep it going you know. yeah and the really only protection this aircraft is the red shrimp passive radar system there see that uh, yeah. screen there and um, the air electronic officer what he would do say he had a lock on of a missile he would tune to the frequency of the lock on and jam it you could also jam the enemy radar as well you could also release flares against heat seeking missiles and also chaff which is foil i've got some here that i got from my vulcan that is the chaff it's not foil it's fiberglass coated fiberglass mm -hmm. And you can get different types here, thin as a hair, and there's different thicknesses, there's like inch and two inch, and various other sizes as well. And each of these come in a packet of about 10,000, they do. And uh, it comes in a tin, like a chocolate finger biscuit tin. And on top of that, there's a parachute. And as soon as you release it out of the aircraft, underneath the aircraft, of course, the parachute opens. And it also opens up the can as well with this, this in and then that would sort of float away in the sky and cause one hell of a problem for the enemy radar yeah. because it couldn't find you because it, there would be yeah, radar screen, signals bouncing yeah. off yeah, yeah. it's probably found like snow on the screen yeah and they won't be able to see you, you know mm. so hopefully again you get out of the way very yeah. quickly yeah. but see it never any guns they did try putting a set of four guns in the nose but the kick of them was too much for the aircraft and uh, and it, touch with it, with yeah, freeze that's right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, of course it would shake, yeah. and you don't wear a helmet. That's one thing you do not wear in here. You couldn't, because you'd be constantly banging your head. So you wear just like the cloth cap, you know, you get yeah. a denim type material, yeah. and you get your ear cams on as well. You know, and again you've got your oxygen mask on here as well. So, uh, but so it can get pretty noisy, and you get a sort of crescendo vibration throughout the whole aircraft. But so this aircraft from about 1982 was then converted for maritime use. It did, did the job of a Nimrod. So what they did, they mounted a, a, a panel there with two cameras on. And so you'd be flying about 300 feet or so above the waves, taking shots of say Russian subs and Russian battleships or whatever. And it did that for quite a few years. And why she, she preserved as well as she has is the fact she was sealed against the penetration of salt. So that's why, right. in that case, why she's lasted longer yeah. than some of the aircraft have. Yeah. 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 And the fact that it cost us two and a half thousand pounds a year to repaint her, it did help having that ceiling done. Mm. So, like, mm. Is there anything else you'd like to know while you're here? Well, <laughs> you've covered most things. Yeah. <laughs> but it's quite amazing. I mean, you look at the size of this yeah. aircraft, yeah. I mean, it's just really a flying yeah. fuel tank and bomb, aren't it? Yeah. yeah. With um, very little for the 
and like no today comforts at all. and like yeah. today when you you go out you're watched everywhere you go out you buy cameras you go in a shop you watch yeah. by cameras in <laughs> here in the 60s you'll watch by cameras yeah. that unit there that yeah. oblong unit there yeah. there's a camera under there and there was light beams that shone down four of them and as you were working of course you break the beam and shots would be taken of your hands to make sure you're going you through the sequence yeah. correctly yeah. and so once you go back to base that will be processed and to check he was going through the hit correctly. Yeah. Seeing the pack he had the well, life or death on his hands. Mm. Uh, he could release a bomb and kill fifty thousand people. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. But, uh, so he had to be certainly watching train. Fifty four weeks of training these three guys had. They had two years of training on average. Because your co pilot hopefully was going to be a future pilot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is that true? Because I remember watching something that first they said about the issue of the eye patches. Yes. Very, very true. Very yes. cold bit of logic. Yes, it? yes, yeah. it is. Yeah, um, we have one of our volunteers. He's a pilot of this aircraft, mm. Mm. and he went through that mm. film training. Yeah, one one eye patch, and then the co-pilot had the other eye patch on. Yeah, you know, yeah. So yeah. One good eye left. Yeah, one good eye left. So when did it last fly this one? Twenty fourth of January, nineteen eighty three, and it landed here at quarter past two in the afternoon. It mm. did, and when it landed, they actually stripped a lot of the stuff out before it came here. All that was gone. The seats were gone as well at the back. Uh, just the pilot and co-pilot, mm. and mm. just in the fuel to get here, because our runway is a third of the size it requires. Yeah. So they had to use the air brakes, also the parachutes as well. And the air brakes, that switch there, that's the air brake switch. We put that down, and the air brakes will come out. And there's two switches above where it says control services. Press those two switches down, and the parachutes will fly out for the back of the aircraft to slow you down. If you bring your aircraft back and you haven't got the parachute in, God, you'll get it. <laughs> you would. You know, if you use a parachute, the ground crew do not like you at all. <laughs> you know, it's it such a big again. job to yeah. put it back in and back it up again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so you play the hell with you. <laughs> you know, you know. Make sure you come back to that next time. Yeah. And these things hanging from the roof here. You'd see these on the un underground railway yeah, coaches. To hang on to it, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. At the time, there must have been break up quite a number of them. We thought, what well, something to be able to let the crew get out of the, you know, actually heave themselves up out of your seat, mm. and that's what they use as well, you know, to move about in the aircraft. Yeah, because some of the controls quite a way out there. Yeah, aren't it they? is. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. But again, this guy didn't have that ability, as you can see. It's all he could do with his seat is pull the seat back and heave himself up using those two. Mm. So he had trust strength in his arms to actually get out of the aircraft. Mm. But say when she was on her way down 30,000 feet drop, just think these guys at the front were hanging forward, these were backwards. Mm. So uh, you know, couldn't do anything about it. You know, as from 1961 as well, when Gary Powers got shot down in 60, as you know, mm. and up until then, all the aircraft were flying high level. They thought, oh, the Russians couldn't get us up, mm. up there, you know, but Gary Powers is at 74,000 feet at the time. And of course, our maximum is 64. Yeah. Because he's a massive target as well. Yeah. Yeah. And so, as from then, we started flying low level and all the aircraft were painted camouflage. Yeah. Were. So, yeah, our pilot has actually taken this aircraft down to 300 feet above the ground wow. through the Scottish Glens. 300 feet of the aircraft like <laughs> this. this. Size, yeah. So just think if you had to get out, you wouldn't have time. No. You wouldn't have no. A, no. There'd be not nowhere enough underneath you to get out. No. You know? It's funny with what you were saying about when this thing came down and that yeah. procedure to get out. I mean, yeah. I think by the time you've even thought about doing that, yeah. it's too late. Too it much. is too late, yeah. yeah. But yeah, the maximum, the height they were travelling at normal was about 3,000 feet, but they flew a heck of a lot lower. Mm. This aircraft has actually flown over the White House. It has. It's in the recorded as such. Mm. It did, and they didn't know we were coming. Mm. You know, totally under radar. Mm. Straight up the top of the White House and down the other side. You know, yeah, which was quite amazing. And again, that was Frank Hilton flew mm. this aircraft mm. at the time, and uh, yeah, we were playing war games with America. Mm. You know, yeah. Yeah, we dropped the bomb on the White House. Um. Yeah, we <coughs> took out all the eastern seaboard of America <laughs> virtually when we played war games. Yeah, Operation Sky Shield it was. Yeah. Yeah, we always won every year. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> okay. No, it's great. Just full of gauges, isn't it? Yeah. But you've got to think there's a lot of duplication there. Yeah, yeah. You know? Oh yeah, because you've got both sides. Because when you're flying sides, modern aircraft, yeah. you've got to have a yeah. secondary set of gauges. Yeah. You know? So everything on one side is duplicated on the other, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is, yeah. All the switches. Yeah. something else. Very claustrophobic in there wasn't it? But you've got to admire the people who flew these things. Right, let's go and have a look at some more planes then. Percival Sea Prince. 1948 with patrol and training aircraft. Zero to this one. English electric lightning. Went, isn't it? Up in there. Well, it's really windy today, so this is a meteor. fighters. That's a phantom over there. You can have a look. Naffy Cafe. Bit more up to date, I guess. Oh my god. 
command. Yep, that time again. Omelet. Oh, puppy. Right, that's pretty much the end of our little um, trip to Cumbria. Really nice little museum here, wasn't it? Mm, very interesting. That um, um, Vulcan was absolutely fascinating being, being in there, seeing what they put up with. If you think it's li living in a motorhome is a bit cramped, <laughs> that's something else. <laughs> seven, of them, seven, of them, seven of them in there. Yeah. I'll go home tomorrow, don't we? Yep. Oh. Yep, go home tomorrow. Then in theory we're home till the 12th, aren't we? Yeah. In theory. In theory. We've got Tara coming to stay, haven't we? Yeah. For a weekend, just before we go. Yeah. So we might go out with her, might we, somewhere? Yeah. Might be tempted to. Yeah, might go out for the day. Or? Or longer. <laughs> <laughs> Watch this space. Watch this space. <laughs> so anyway, if you if you like what you see, if you like what you see, <laughs> give us a thumbs up. Remember to subscribe. Hit the notifications icon, and we'll catch up with you soon. See you then. <laughs>